And a drum roll, please. This video is once again sponsored by Skillshare, the online learning community where creative and curious individuals like you, yes, you, my dear viewer, can access thousands of classes on pretty much any subject that you can imagine. You want to finally write that novel that's been floating around in your head for the past five years? Well, bam! Two and a half thousand results so you can find precisely what you need, what kind of style you want and everything. You want to get started on that YouTube channel you've been thinking about? You can finally put me in my place with an angry reply video. Well, boom! 1,500 results for video editing in any program or style that you can imagine. If you follow me on Facebook or, or you keep track of my community tab posts, you may know that these past few weeks I've actually been developing my new LLC, the Native Oak. Uh, though I've definitely had some difficulties with my branding strategy because I'm an archaic educator, not a hip businessman. I still use words like hip, that should tell you all that you need to know. And my vague visions of grandeur have been difficult to really well, get off the ground, make them real. Well, gosh darn it, if only I could have a really quick, like, a bit of mentorship on exactly that subject so I could better brand my business. If only I, I knew someone who could tell me about, boom, brand strategy, build a business that lasts with Mark Pollard. Literally an hour long how to on exactly the question that I was having. Skillshare is a specially curated platform intended for learning. They don't have any adverts on their content and they're always putting out more. So for whatever you need to get done in your life but you need a little bit of guidance in the right direction, well you can click on the link in the description below for a full month free trial. Please do check them out. It really helps myself and this channel and I do think that it can help you as well. Thank you to Skillshare for sponsoring this video and now on to it. The English Longbow. Nearly two meters of stout yew wood, with draw weights in excess of 150 pounds, losing a three-foot-long arrow potentially hundreds of yards away. Limited only by how fast one could draw a bowstring, a trained archer could block the sun with a continuous rain of death. It's the weapon of legend from Agincourt, which many a website has gone so far as to describe as the machine gun of the medieval age. Now compare that to a flintlock musket. In popular conception, these weapons were highly inaccurate, incredibly short-ranged, and painfully slow to reload. They were incredibly noisy and immediately gave away the position of any man firing it due to the great plumes of smoke shot from its front and rear. That very same smoke, when the muskets were fired en masse, could also temporarily blind their users if the wind wasn't very strong that day. They were also quite prone to failure in the field, be it from wet gunpowder on a rainy or even just an overly humid day, a flint losing its edge, or its steel being softened over time. And of course, the longer you use the things, the harder they become to load because of the buildup of thick black powder residue called fouling in the barrel. So, why did armies bother using muskets at all? I don't get how the musket came into play though, like, I think it went to bow be so much more effective. Because if you actually know, know how to use it, it's active. a question that I've often been asked, and indeed, I've had not an insignificant number of commenters in the past inform me that the abandonment of the bow entirely was a silly thing, and that even if they're logistically a bit more difficult in some ways, it would have behooved any military of the long 18th century to maintain at least a cadre of elite longbow wielding troops. In fact, the same commenters might tell me, the Duke of Wellington even saw this clear advantage of the old ways over the new, and requested horse guards to send him a company of elite longbow-wielding troops to fight Napoleon, only to be turned down. Or at least, so I'm told again by certain comments. To put it mildly, I have my doubts as to the veracity of this claim, and would ask those who purport it for any primary source which actually corroborates it, which I don't think I've ever even seen a secondary source for it, let alone something actually from the time period. And no, I think I remember it from a book, is not a reliable source. And even if I'm wrong on that one, and Wellington did at some point request this troop of medieval warriors, still I would hold to my guns, pun very much intended, that such a thing would have been rather silly. And that is because despite a very few select, moderate advantages in very specific environments, at the end of the day, the English longbow, as great as it was, is an inherently lesser weapon, both of war and of battle, than the 18th century flintlock musket. And this is very much based off a number of very key and unfortunately common misconceptions and myths. 
not so much about the efficiency of the longbow, mind, but that of the musket. Now, yes, when you compare them to modern-day firearms, of course, a musket is slow to load and inaccurate and all the rest of it. But on its own terms, in its historical context, you'll find that they were really quite extraordinary devices. And that is not only in terms of logistics and economy, though we'll talk about all that a little bit later on because it's definitely the most important factor, but also in terms of their battlefield performance, which we'll cover first. It's maybe the, the uh, more exciting bit there. But before we do, a quick word of thanks to the individuals who made this video possible, my supporters on Patreon. As of my writing, this, there are currently around 200 exceptionally generous individuals who support me there. And I know it is a tired thing to say by this point that the videos wouldn't be possible without them, but truly, theirs is the income that I can rely on the most, no matter what may be happening with YouTube ad revenue and the like. Because, yes, while sometimes my ad revenue is fantastic and could literally cover all of my expenses on its own, other times it could cover closer to a tenth of that, and I'll let you guess which one is more often the case. A lot of YouTube is, quite frankly, outside of my control. Things like CPM, how much YouTube is promoting my content and all the rest, the algorithms and whatnot, you know how it all works. The point is that Patreon is the most stable form of income that I have. It's something that I can rely on. So when I say that these videos are really only possible because of my supporters there, I really do mean that. That happy little band of supporters that scrolls in the comments at the end of every video, they make all of this possible, allowing me to keep publishing these videos for what I hope is ultimately the education and entertainment of many, many more individuals out there. So, to my noble patrons, again, thank you. But, right, that is enough pontificating, back to the video. Muskets are better than bows! Firstly, let's talk about range and accuracy, shall we? Raise your hand if you've ever heard this one before. Muskets were so inaccurate that soldiers could never hit their target even at a hundred yards. In fact, they would never even aim. They would just rely on having a great big wall of lead. That's why they had to fire in volleys. And I imagine that a great deal of you are now raising your hands. Get them down, you look ridiculous. I'm, I'm a man in a computer for God's sake, you don't have to listen to me. Anyways. Then you compare that piece of common trivia, this insane inaccuracy of muskets, where many people believe, indeed, that soldiers wouldn't be aiming their piece, it was so bad, although, incidentally, soldiers would aim and were specifically trained to do so, at least in the British Army, to the sorts of things that you can easily find about English longbows when you search up their own statistics. Now, I can't really vouch for the veracity of any of this information. I I've never shot a longbow myself, and I'm not a medievalist. But regardless of whether it's true or not, these are the sorts of things that people are reading about the longbows, and this is what they're forming their ideas off of regarding which weapon is superior. You know, when they say something like, the longbow is better than a musket, this is the information that a lot of people are operating off of. And I doubt that the bow would be more effective than what is detailed on these websites, so I think that uh, for our purposes today, it's safe to use these statistics. Just, just make sure to take them with a bit of salt, is my only, is my only point. In an article describing the English longbow as the AK-47 of its day, interesting now. comparison, uh, for example, archeryhistorian.com writes that the absolute minimum practice range with a longbow in Henry VIII's Tudor England was about 200 meters, or around 220 yards. And meanwhile, modern day archers can get up to 380 yards out with the things, which tells me at least that the historical standard was probably somewhere between those two points. You know, if the old minimum was 200, they're probably getting more than that, and if nowadays with ideal conditions we can get to 380, it's probably somewhere in between those two. Uh, then even more extreme, the Encyclopedia Britannica article titled The Infantry Revolution, uh, circa 1200 to 1500, claims that longbows could shoot up to 500 yards with special light arrows, although it does place the more usual range at closer between 150 and 300 yards. So that's about comparable to what the other website said as well. Going between 150 and 500, again, we, we get a median of around 325 yards of range for the English longbow. Al although that same website does also describe how bows could just punch straight through armor, which we'll come to a bit later on, but it, it isn't entirely true, to say the least. So I, I doubt those figures a little bit, but we'll, we'll still take the very rough average as more or less something that we can look to accurately. So wow, I mean, apparently these things could effectively shoot three times further, even more, than a musket, right? Well, not, not quite. Uh, 
Here, once again, I will refer to an excellent article over at Cabinetskrieg by Alex Burns titled, How Close Ranged Were Mid-18th Century Firefights, uh, which I'll also link down below if you'd like to read more about the sources for this information and more about its context. But suffice to say from the article, a pretty effective range of muskets could go up to 200 yards, with soldiers even beginning to skirmish with their enemies out to 300 yards or even further. And that range of effective 200 yards, even out to 300, that's an easily comparable range to that provided by archeryhistorian.com, and well within the commonly effective range given by Britannica. So overall, at the very least, I'd say the ranges of the two weapons are comparable to each other. But of course, a comparable effective range doesn't really help to prove one weapon being better than the other. It only shows that they're, well, comparable. And then we come to Rate of Fire, and I can't pull anything fancy there because it's pretty straightforward that the longbow wins out. A well-drilled soldier can probably only load his musket between two and four times every minute in a battlefield environment. And yes, I know that there are, there are those like weird parade exceptions of like five and six shots a minute, but those are very rare for the 18th century, and they're not usually being achieved in a battlefield standard. Broadly speaking, we're talking two to four rounds a minute. Meanwhile, the process of loosing an arrow from a bow is much easier and faster. HistoricUK.com, in an article titled The Longbow, cites a shooting rate of up to 12 arrows per minute, while Archery Historian gives a more modest figure of 6 shots a minute. And either way, that's a lot faster than 2 to 4. But, and this is where I do pull out my fancy stop, that advantage of the bow is still tempered by another very important factor in any military engagement, let's cheekily call it staying power. For starters, it's difficult to shoot a longbow. Very difficult. I mean, the things have draw weights like going up to 200 pounds, for crying out loud. Now, that has training implications, which we'll discuss later on, but suffice to say, the heavier the bow gets, the harder it is to use over and over again efficiently. Now, no matter how strong and well-trained those archers are, something tells me they wouldn't be able to maintain the same speed and consistency in their shooting for quite so long as someone like, say, a musketeer could. Simply put, it's an extremely physically taxing thing to loose arrow after arrow. And meanwhile, even I can load and fire a musket over and over again without at least too much concern. And I don't think I have to tell you that I'm probably not the strongest fellow in the field. I am hardly representative of a soldier under arms. A musket is easy to load and aim. It doesn't rely over much on the individual strength of its user for its range or accuracy. So long as it's the same amount of powder being poured down that barrel and its user is able to hold it straight, that shot will pretty much go the same direction as the hundred rounds fired before it. Now, yes, things like fouling in the barrel can make it harder to load a musket over time, but overall I think that effect is far less of a concern when compared to, again, trying to pull or, or push against, I suppose is more accurately a way to phrase it, a longbow of 200 pounds draw weight. The fouling doesn't scale anywhere near so intensely as one's muscles getting tired from the repeated loosing of a longbow. And additionally, as concerns staying power, let's talk about ammunition. Those three-foot-long wood and iron arrows are very impressive, yes, but one has to wonder how many of them a soldier can actually carry at any given time. These things are awkward to carry, they're large, they're weirdly shaped, and compared to, you know, musket ammunition, they're quite heavy as well. Now, I don't know for certain how many arrows a longbowman or a medieval army would be able to bring into battle, and I imagine that that number is going to, you know, vary an awful lot from situation to situation, but when you compare that three-foot-long wooden arrow to a musket cartridge, being the 70 some odd caliber lead ball, a couple hundred grains of black powder, and some paper, it's probably going to be a fair amount less than a musket-wielding army could carry. So then, not only are those archers starting off with less ammunition, if they're going to be using that same superior rate of shooting, then they're going to be running out of ammunition an awful lot faster as well. So if they want to be able to stay in the field on campaign for a lot longer, either they're going to be lessening their rate of shooting an awful lot, which then would negate that particular advantage over the musket, or at least lessen the advantage, or they're going to be loosing all of their arrows much faster and then have to resort to melee combat. 
unless, of course, they do somehow manage to bring more or equivalent arrows to the other side's musket balls, but that is less than likely, again, largely due to logistical concerns, as we will see later on. Now, of course, yes, this wouldn't be a problem if the archers are all deadly accurate and manage to take out their enemy with the ammunition they have before running out of that ammunition ever becomes a problem. But given the usual rate of how many rounds are actually fired or loosed for every actual hit in a military setting, unless every medieval archer was like Legolas or something, I don't suppose that would be very much of a real concern. They're going to need a lot more than just a hundred arrows to kill a hundred musketmen. In the same way, of course, that those hundred musketmen would need a lot more than a hundred musket balls to kill a hundred longbowmen. And a lot of times when it comes to firefights, it's not so much a matter of killing off the entire enemy unit, so much as it is using your fire to consistently keep an enemy in a certain position. If you're able to maintain a harsh enough rate of fire on them that they can't move and maneuver, then you can do things like flank around them with other units, or get in with cavalry, or hit them with artillery, anything like that. Even if the musket men are shooting less quickly, they're still able to get off enough shots to pin down an enemy unit, and if they're able to pin down that enemy unit for much, much longer than the longbowmen could, because the longbowmen simply aren't able to bring in enough ammunition, well, again, you can start to see where a problem might arise there. And with that, we come to the real kicker, because something like, like rate of fire and how long a unit could stay in the field without running out of ammunition, like, it, it's a concern, but it's not the biggest concern. Rather, something like melee combat here is going to be much more clearly significant, I think. And again, this sort of thing will also speak to larger and more important logistical concerns, but we'll come to all that later. For now, individual battles is what we're talking about. A musket can fix a bayonet. It is a ranged weapon as well as a highly efficient close combat weapon. And in that way, it is sort of like a longbow and a spear combined into one. For a musket-wielding army to charge, they can move right up to extremely close range, unleash two or three ranks of volley fire into an enemy, immediately come down to the charge, and then push. Or alternatively, if they themselves are being charged, they can be firing into an oncoming enemy up until the literal last second and still be fully capable of repelling that charge with their bayonets. Meanwhile, for a longbowman to do the same, he needs to be carrying a sword at his side. He needs to have some sort of other external weapon. It takes time to swap between those weapons. It's increased weight that he has to carry both in battle and on campaign. And of course, a sword is generally far less efficient in close quarters combat than a spear would be, or in this instance, a bayonet. Now, it's possible, yes, that the bowman can just bring a spear along instead of a sword, but the size of the thing would probably make things even more complicated, and you still have to swap between the two weapons, which makes you lose valuable time in a combat scenario. And this also means that archers, whether they have swords or carry spears on their back or whatever, are far less efficient against cavalry, because they can't do something like form square against it reliably. Now, it's absolutely false that cavalry will refuse to charge a square, they would do so. And that could very well be a video all its own, but still, it really helps to discourage that cavalry charge when not only do you have a continuous line of bayonets thrust outwards against it, but also a constant volleying by soldiers who are firing by files, which is a method of firing where the men will like pair up or team up together, and one of them will always be loaded while the other one is taking his shot or reloading himself. Which means that if a square that's firing by files is going to be charged, no matter what timing they pick, there will always be a volley ready to blast into them, and then that line of bayonets is right there at the charge. The best you can do with archers, on the other hand, is to have half of them with melee weapons and half of them shooting at any given time. Now, yes, maybe we don't have to worry about things like shooting rates because the archers are, are shooting faster, but then again, only half of them are prepared for that charge with their melee weapons. Meanwhile, even if you're loading your musket, it doesn't take a lot of energy to throw it forward with that bayonet. Above all else, it's this versatility of the musket that's probably its single most important feature over the longbow. At its absolute least, the musket can effectively match the longbow for range and accuracy, and it can maintain both for much longer periods of time with less effort. It may not be able to shoot so quickly, but it can be kept shooting for far longer, both in terms of physical requirements and logistical concerns like ammunition supply. 
And unlike the bow, which is strictly and specifically a ranged weapon, the musket can be used in practically any military environment. With an army of musketmen, you don't need to worry about reinforcing your ranged formations with separate formations of melee troops. Instead, they're all just these singular, cohesive blocks. They're able to dish out their firepower up until the last possible second, and then engage in melee combat as well with effective close-ranged weapons. You might have different units, yes, with certain proclivities. You know, maybe the heavy infantry grenadiers are really good to, uh, to send into the bayonet charge. Meanwhile, the light infantrymen are really good at range and sniping with the enemy. But all the same, no matter what kind they are, every soldier is still capable of fighting effectively in close and long-range combat. They are versatile and they are adaptable because of their weapons. Now, with all that being said, I suspect that this is the moment that a number of individuals will still take to the comments to point out all the factors that I am neglecting here in this argument. In fact, they've probably already done so about 15 minutes ago. But Brandon, they will say to me, you're forgetting some of the most important advantages that a longbow has over the musket. For example, the longbow, when compared to the musket, is quieter. So much quieter that it suddenly makes things like ambush tactics so much more viable. To which I would say, well, the Spanish guerrillas certainly had no trouble with their muskets when they were ambushing Napoleon's troops, uh, nor American militiamen sniping at British officers, for that matter. Uh, nor, in fact, the British light infantry sniping at American rebels either. You see, silence and secrecy may be very important at the very start of an ambush, but honestly, once the battle has actually begun, I'm not sure there's actually too much of a need to have a perfectly silent weapon. Uh, the enemy will obviously know they're under attack, and once you've sprung the trap, you're not going to be relying so much on being unknown as you will on being in the superior position and having surprise on your side, which incidentally is where a musket's ability to be fired and loaded while kneeling and laying prone, something which I imagine is a bit more difficult to achieve with a longbow. And similarly, if after the ambush is discovered, the enemy tries to force their way through uh, to you with a, with a bayonet charge, that is usually the logical thing to do, well again, we come to the problem with bows in melee combat. The musket man can fend off that charge, the longbowman less capable of doing so. And as much as programs like Sharp or The Patriot may wish us to believe otherwise, an ambush is rarely, if ever, sufficient to actually defeat an enemy army. A guerrilla force will usually be attacking supply lines, raiding garrisons. They're targeting weaker enemy positions. They're attacking the enemy where they're most vulnerable. You can't just take a plucky company of 20 or 50 men, camp them in the mountains or behind some stone wall, and have them take down the Grand Army and liberate a country. Whether they have a bow or a rifle, whether their protagonist is wearing a hat or not, whether he slept with every woman in Spain, it, it, none of it matters. And if you're using a large enough force to actually make this ambush a general action, like actually attacking an enemy army, well at that point then you're dealing with such large formations of men that once again I have to wonder at the value, if any at all, of a quieter weapon. I mean, the enemy may not hear the bows too well, yes, but they're certainly going to see the massive horde of gaily clad archers that come marching over top the hillside. You see, as it is, guerrilla actions and being sneaky beaky may aid military campaigns, but it's not generally going to win them. And given all of the logistical and economic problems with something like a longbow, which I promise you will get to that soon, well, they just aren't worth the necessary investment for their limited return in that kind of ambush scenario. Think about it this way. If you really set your mind to it, then yes, you can always figure some particular scenario where a longbow would be greatly useful to an 18th century army. Oh, uh, we just needed to be in this kind of environment with these sorts of starting conditions and exactly this disposition of the men on either side and blah 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 blah, well then the longbow would absolutely trounce the standard issue musketry. Well, alright, yeah, sure. But how often are we actually going to have that specific exact scenario realistically playing out? If you design a weapon that is only actually useful in a very specific scenario like that, especially in an historic environment like the Napoleonic Wars, for example, then you're going to doom yourself to failure. I mean, yes, maybe a longbow is just the perfect weapon for some really super specific scenario, 
but if I were a soldier, I'd rather take the weapon that'll save my skin 99 times out of 100, and I'll take my chances in the off possibility that I'm inserted into some young adult fantasy novel where the plot calls for a Legolas instead of a Rifleman Harris. And much the same argument, I think, could be made for something like smoke production, or any other perceived sneaky-beaky advantage of the longbow over the musket. In how many circumstances will the lack of smoke really prove so material an advantage when compared to the usual experiences of the soldier who would actually be using those weapons? The most I can see here in terms of like realistic and regularly applicable advantages for the bow would be that if the wind is low, you're not going to have your own formations temporarily blinding themselves after firing a heavy volley. But advantages like that, or maybe the fact that individual muskets are more prone to failure and misfires in the field, are nowhere near sufficient to justify the larger concerns at play. And again, we're almost there. But lastly before that, what sort of video about muskets or bows would this be if I didn't talk about armor penetration? And this, of course, is the moment when those on both sides of the aisle will proudly step forward to proclaim to the heavens how their chosen weapon was the thing that made armor obsolete. With musket balls and long bar arrows, both, they'll claim, able to punch straight on through the thickest and most expensive of French armor. And of course, both sides would be wrong. Armor would not be used if it could be broken through quite so easily. Now, both weapons in their respective time periods are going up against armor, be it an English longbowman against a French knight at Agincourt, or a British foot soldier against a French cuirassier at Waterloo. And in both instances, while yes, sometimes the weapon would take down an armored opponent with a lucky shot, or by hitting the armor at a very particular weak point or different angle, something like that, in many other instances, the armor is going to do its job. It's going to deflect the blow. 18th century cavalry armor was more than capable of deflecting or even stopping musket shots outright, and indeed they were proofed to do so. Why didn't every soldier wear armor during that time period then? Well, I can talk about that in the future of the video if we'd like, but long story short, because of economical concerns and logistical concerns. And as far as longbows go, they as well were not the armor-piercing weapons that they're often made out to be. If they were, I can guarantee you that those same French knights wouldn't have insisted on wearing their fancy suits of armor that cost them a small fortune and limited their visibility and whatnot. Now, if you'd like to see some evidence for that and a deeper discussion that surpasses honestly anything I could ever provide you, then I'll link an excellent video by Todd's Workshop in the description down below about English longbows and armor. Again, in both cases here, could it pierce through the armor if it hits at the right angle or hits a weaker part of the armor, something like that? Absolutely. But also, could both weapons be stopped in their tracks by a well-made breastplate? Again, absolutely. So in that regard, taken in their respective time periods, again, the musket is at the very least equal to the longbow, and in many other aspects which are key to 18th century warfare, musketry far surpasses the bow. Now, are there situations in which you'd be better served by a company of professional longbowmen than by a company of musketmen? Absolutely! I'm sure we could think of hundreds, millions of examples where that would be the case. But the real question then would be, what proportion of likely, not simply possible, scenarios would that be when compared to the other way around? In other words, two nerds sitting at their wargaming table, and there's a pot calling the kettle black, can come up with endless scenarios in which either weapon would win out against the other. But in real life, the situations in which the longbow would win are, and I'm willing to bet this, far far less likely and numerous than those in which the musket would win out. But hold on, Brandon! You once again shout to me, you're going on and on and waffling this and that and the other, but still you've neglected one of the most important elements of the debate, something you even mentioned at the very start yourself, reliability. Muskets are prone to all sorts of different failures in the field. A flint may be poorly napped or dull, the steel may be softened with time and refuse to yield a spark, any one of a bunch of different springs or screws may be rusted inside the lock and stop the flintlock from working properly, or the powder may just be wet, even too humid, it may just not feel very good that day, and the musket just doesn't want to work. And all of that, I admit it, is perfectly fair. I can't speak too much to the reliability of a bow and arrow, but I'd absolutely believe that they are more consistently reliable weapons than muskets are, and we all know how 
insanely important a factor something like a weapon's reliability is. But in military history, this is another very important thing, we can never just consider weapons on their individual basis. And with that in mind, finally we come to what is by immensely large margins the most important element in this discussion, and unfortunately a one which is often neglected by the aforementioned nerd sitting at the game shop. Logistics. You see, if artillery is the king of battle, then logistics is the god of war. Now, I've seen an awful lot of different figures on exactly how long it takes to train a longbowman to be competent enough at his art for military service, but at the end of the day, all of those figures are an awful lot longer than it takes to hammer the manual exercise into some country yokel. It speaks for itself, I should think, that a significant part of Tudor English life was the continual, that is weekly, practice of its population at the longbow. The 1511 Act Concerning Shooting in Longbows under King Henry VIII details that unless you have an excuse like being infirm or a man of the cloth, every man and boy aged from 7 to 60 needs to have a bow and regularly practice it. I believe it was usually after church on Sundays men would spend a couple of hours practicing with their bows. Men with children under their care would by law need to furnish them with bows and arrows, and employers would have to supply bows and arrows for servants out of their wages. And by the time that any boy turned 17, it was a legal requirement for him to own his own bow alongside at least four arrows. There were even some basic price controls in place for bow makers to make sure that the population doesn't have an excuse for not acquiring these long bows. It stated that, quote, For every bow of you that he maketh, to sell at least two bows of elm or other wood of mean, being of an affordable, price. In order to be able to regularly supply enough longbowmen who are skilled enough at their arms to really be reliable and competent in battle, uh, such as to achieve the sorts of numbers we were talking about earlier in terms of accuracy and rate of shooting and the like, significant portions of English society basically had to revolve around the longbow. And simply put, none of that is the case for a musketman who is far easier, cheaper, and faster to train for a soldier. You can't just take some random civilian off the street, give them a longbow, and have them be a professional in a year's time. It takes years and years to build up the muscles to be able to actually properly use a full draw weight bow to its full potential. But for a musket, after that country yokel is put to the exercise and firing at marks for a full year? Absolutely you could expect him to load, fire, and march in good time, and hit his mark out to 100, 200, even more potentially yards. I've seen reenactors do as much in a year of once-monthly weekend events, let alone through continual military service. Indeed, in real life, you wouldn't need anywhere close to a year of training to enter into service as a musket man. So if we circle back around, what does any of this have to do with the rate of misfiring? Well, it's fairly simple. Yes, let's say, and, and this is a completely random number, so please don't take it as actually representative of the real figure. Let's just say that in a great big line of a thousand flintlocks, 10% of them will misfire. That is a lot, and if they were going up muzzle to, well, muzzle to shaft, I suppose? Uh, if they were going up against another thousand longbows, well then yes, that is going to be a problem if 10% of your men are not firing while the other 10% on the other side are very much engaging in the battle. But principally speaking, that isn't going to be how it happens. It's not going to be an even match. It's never going to be an even match. It's probably something closer to two, five, ten thousand musketeers against that same thousand longbowmen. The saying goes that if you want to train a longbowman, you have to start with his grandfather. But if you want to train a musketeer, start on Tuesday. Now obviously, yes, you can get great degrees of marksmanship and skill with a musket beyond just a few weeks of training and practice at the manual exercise. You could dedicate a lifetime to it just as you could with a longbow. But when it comes to the minimum standard of military performance, the bar is set much lower. And that means more musketmen of greater relative skill more quickly and cheaper than you could ever hope to get out of longbowmen. And there are a few other logistical factors, less important ones to be sure, but still, they feed into this basic economic principle. Like we mentioned earlier, ammunition. 
Musket balls, black powder, and paper to make cartridges can all be mass-produced in a largely industrial fashion by an 18th century economy. But arrowheads need to be handcrafted. Shafts need to be individually cut, fletchings collected and applied one by one. And each of these things is done by their own artisan. Yes, you can have soldiers make a bunch of arrows out of sticks and rocks that they find on campaign, but those will never achieve the same range and force we've been talking about for these comparisons. And then you have the difficulties of transporting that ammunition to the men. Not only are the arrows harder and more expensive to produce, then they're also heavier, they're larger, and they're more awkwardly shaped. An army of longbowmen, even if by some miracle it were equally sized to an army of musketeers, would need a much longer supply train if they carried the same amount of ammunition. And that's not all. Longbowmen, as we discussed earlier, are less capable of defending themselves in melee combat. They're going to need attaches of pikemen, and all of that additional equipment of a very different sort would also need to be produced and transported. The longbowmen might also need swords or shorter spears for themselves to carry in case something goes wrong, and that's yet another kind of equipment to produce, transport, and maintain. Meanwhile, musket-wielding infantry with their bayonets are both melee and ranged troops. They require one kind of weapon and one only. The musket allows for greater standardization across the board than a longbow ever could. And that as well, I think, is what makes the idea of using that small elite cadre of longbowmen in something like the Peninsular Wars not really work. I mean, if they already exist and they can provide all their own stuff and they just want to fight entirely on their own, then I mean, yeah, sure, great. Maybe the army will find a use for you. But otherwise, even if it isn't a massive program, it still means you're dedicating disproportionate energies and monies to equipping and supplying these men. Extra shipments of ammunition, new kinds of artisans on the books to produce that ammunition, new training for officers, even entirely new doctrines on how and when to best apply these new kinds of troops. All of that to say nothing about, again, how long it would take to actually train those new kinds of troops. And all of that in the end for these soldiers who are less practical than the musketeers and only really are useful in insanely specific scenarios where even then they're only marginally better than a veteran soldier with a musket because of these little factors like, oh, they don't make smoke when they shoot or they're quieter or some such. It's infinitely better in the end to dedicate that same economic expenditure, which includes not just things like government money, but also things like domestic production, administrative complexity, and logistical space, literally logistical space. And instead you can dedicate all of that energy to outfitting even greater numbers of regular infantry battalions or cavalry troops or artillery batteries. All of these things are far more useful in far greater numbers of scenarios than a longbowman could ever hope to be on the early modern battlefield. So at the end of it all, I'm sure that I've missed all sorts of factors in this video. Even after rambling on and on and on for such an ungodly length of time, Undoubtedly, there are some things that I missed. Without a doubt, there will be all sorts of comments down below pointing out the advantages of a longbow that I've never considered. But in the end, it really does strike me that, at the most extreme, that the best we can reasonably say in defense of the longbow is that it is a rough equivalent to a flintlock musket in most regards, with maybe some slight advantages in certain fields, but then, of course, disadvantages, or should I say drawbacks, haha, in others as well. And even that, I think, is pushing it. I think we can still say, honestly, that the musket is a better individual weapon than the longbow, but again, I don't know everything about the longbow, so maybe there are some things that I'm missing there. But in the end, no matter how amazingly skilled, no matter how great of an archer you have down at the range that proves the superiority of his weapon over the general musket, in the end, no matter what, the martial artist shall always give way to the military economist. Does that work? I, I feel, I don't know, that sounded better in my head, I feel like. Anyways, you get the idea. This video was edited by Mr. Jaron Green, who alongside being one of my fantastic editors, is an author. And if you enjoyed this video, I'd appreciate it if you gave his website a peek, particularly his new fantasy graphic novel, if that genre interests you. And of course, thank you all for watching, most particularly to my ever-beneficent supporting classes on Patreon.com. For, as I said before, it is by virtue of their support that I'm able to carry on with my work. 
Until the next time, my dear viewer, I am and I shall remain.